question, um, panel members, that we're asking ourselves this morning is what role does community play in terms of dealing with the gang violence and the escalation of the gang violence problem that we have here in Central Florida? It's interesting, uh, in 1975, I did the same thing. That's 1975, some, before some of you were born, I was asked to sit on a gang violence task force in Orange County. We were just starting to experience gangs, or what we thought were gangs back then. And uh, a few years later, I'm here doing the same thing again, which is somewhat scary, because while we've grown in uh, gang and gang organization and gang strength, I'm not sure we have an organization is fighting gangs. Uh, I've spent 30-some years in enforcement and prosecution. Uh, I'm now working with, with the state attorney and also helping with UCF and some research. Uh, I'm kind of tired of enforcing and chasing these people. I'm more interested in finding out the causation of it and working on the causation. And at the same time, we have a perfect storm coming where we have the Florida, about $5 billion reduction in its budget, looking at cutting all those things that we finally got put together to reduce gang violence. Gang violence starts right after Head Start. It's not a 14-year-old thing. Head Start is a program that works extremely well, and if you look, if you track Head Start or what used to be Head Start, kids and the families, those were more successful families. As Head Start started losing federal monies and, and become smaller, you started seeing the families become stressed and more problem. I use Head Start, there are a lot of problems out there. There are a lot of solutions out there. What we haven't done is match those. Uh, my concern is, and I'm glad the question is as it is, because if we don't rely on the community to do this, we're not going to be rely on our Florida government to do that, and we surely cannot rely on our federal government to get us past this, this crisis point. Uh, last year, our office, and Mr. Lamar may have said this this morning, prosecuted somewhere in that 78,000 or 80,000 groups uh, numbers. Uh, tremendous amount, uh, one of the highest per capita in the state of Florida. I can't put a gang association to that number. What I can tell you is that there are a lot of kids out there, and Rusty, to me, will probably give you most of what you need to know. But I will tell you is the wannabe factor in the gangs is what concerns us the greatest. It is there can be more violent. They're younger. They don't understand consequences as much as older folks do, although they're still dangerous. The wannabe factor is a very, very dangerous situation. And that actually wannabe gang mentality starts very, very young. And so we need to put the resources into that young group. So I'm going to pass this on. I was just, uh, I'm glad the question was as it is because that's something I'm interested in. Hi, my name is Carrie Lee, and I used to be a public defender in the juvenile division for a number of years. Um, however, I did leave the office in order to work with the Juvenile Justice Center of Barry. Um, what that was is we received a grant from the Eckerd Foundation to assist juvenile defenders throughout the state and help train them and provide resources. And one of that huge part that we find important is as a defender, you're to advocate for the child. You're not the guardian ad litem, which means you're not the best interest. But we also have social workers and what we try to do is try and provide the most resources that we can for these children that are involved in the system. Um, what we found a lot of cases are you don't have parent involvement. Parents don't show up. They don't come to court. They throw their kids, just to be bluntly, under the bus. I mean, it was amazing when I first became involved in the juvenile system after being an adult is watching these parents just berate their children right in front of them. And I think one thing that we were talking about is having a community, having rootedness, and having structure. And if the parents aren't even coming and participating as a parent in the courtroom, that's just really important. And for us, we found it was very hard. A lot of kids, there's a program called Bay Point in Miami where um, they're treated with respect. They don't wear uniforms. They wear khaki pants. They wear a nice shirt. They're treated as adults. They're treated with respect. And I've had some that would rather stay on an independent living than return back home. Um, so for us, it's very much we need wraparound services. It's not just let's put the child, let's put them away in a commitment program for six to eight months um, because they're just going to return right back into the community that they're involved in. 
So as we're talking about how community is important, it is important. And the school resource officers that are in a lot of the schools, I think, could be a really good thing if they're there mentoring these kids rather than any little, you know, opportunity they can arrest them. Um, and for us, I mean, that's very important to establish that relationship, to give kids a reason to go to school. A lot of the kids, for me, I mean, even in just my five minute meeting with them, I treated them with respect. And for them, they were more responding to me than anybody else just because I was giving them structure and emotional support, but also treating them like an adult. One thing down in Miami they are creating is called the, um, let me get the exact term for you. They have what's called functional family therapy. And what it is, is if you're not familiar, it's kind of a wraparound services. And they've found that kids that they put on probation, giving them wraparound services where you have people coming into the home. They're counseling siblings, they're counseling parents, and they're counseling the kids. And there's less recidivism with that than spending the money and putting them in commitment programs. The other thing that's interesting down there is they also have what's called citations. So rather than arresting the kids there when they get in trouble at school, they'll give them a citation with certain consequences. So rather than being involved in the delinquency system and being exposed to other kids who may be in gangs, um, they're, they're preventing it there. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rusty Keeble. Uh, again, I'm the president for the Florida Gang Investigator Association. I'm also president for the National Alliance of Gang Investigator Association. Um, I want to touch on what was mentioned earlier. But, you know, one of the things that we have a tendency to think about uh, as a community is that a problem such as the gang problem is a law enforcement problem. And it's not a law enforcement problem. It's a community problem. Law enforcement is brought in when the community can no longer control its problem. And we have a tendency to blame law enforcement for not being able to control the problem. And we as a community, me included, as part of that community, has a tendency to have a blind eye to the problems that are around us. And we have, we, we have to do one thing. We, we, have to, we have to understand what is the allure. What is it that a gang has that attracts a child or even an adult into such a lifestyle? we have to look to find out what that allure is and then that allure is what we have to attack. And part of that is community involvement. The child is looking for somebody or something to whether it's taking up the person's time, giving them the respect that they're looking for, or giving them the guidance or the leadership in order to take them to that next level. If the parent fails to do that and the community fails to do that, or any of the, uh, the individuals in that child's life fails to do that, they will look to somebody to give them that. A gang member, a drug dealer, anybody in that category are the ones that will give them that, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And we have to go after the allure. Then, once you go after the allure and you can remove the allure, then you begin to render the gang ineffectual because they now no longer have something to sell to that child or to that adult to bring them into that lifestyle. You know, to talk about the wannabe factor, we call it the gonna be factor. And the wannabe is a term that is very widely used all over this world. And it's one that is absolutely correct in its term, but I think it's a little misleading in its meaning because we have a tendency to think that the wannabes are the ones that we don't have to look at because we need to pay attention to the hardcore members that law enforcement have to deal with. When in essence, it's the wannabes, again the gonabes, that are the ones that are the most dangerous, the ones that we have to be more concerned about because those are the ones that have everything to prove. Now coming from a correctional background, we see that as, as plain as day as anywhere else. You can take an inmate and have that inmate walk into a unit. And if he's a hardcore gang member from a popular city that is recognized for gang activities, such as LA or Chicago or some big time gang banging city, then they walk in and they have an automatic fear to them. They have an automatic sense of respect from the other inmates that are in there because of their reputation, because they're hardcore. 
That person doesn't have to say anything, do anything, feel anything, or get anything to get the respect or the fear that he's looking for within that population. Same goes within the school system. Same goes within the community. Same goes within the prison system, the juvenile justice system. Now you take that wannabe or that gonna be and you walk that kid or that adult in that same environment. Nobody cares who that kid is. Nobody cares who that adult is. So that kid who wants that respect or wants that recognition or that instant identification that we all strive for because we all have that human need to be identified with, they have to do something to get that same level of fear. They have to do something to get that same level of respect. But yet we as a society tend to overlook the gonna be. Those are the ones that we need to address. Those are the ones that hold a great majority of our population in terms of the gang population. If you look at the overall population and the hardcore gang member, they're minimal. There's very few hardcore gang leaders in the world, but there's a whole lot of gang gonna be's in the world. Those are the ones that the community needs to wrap themselves around. Those are the ones that we have the opportunity to turn around because those are the ones that have not made it to the level that Roland and I have to deal with in terms of putting them in prison. Then when you talk about the wraparound, there's still, it doesn't stop after jail. It doesn't stop after prison. We can't put them in prison and expect that they're not going to still have control or access to the community that put them in prison. They actually have more control. In a lot of places around the country, the jails and the prisons run the streets because it's the hardcore leadership that we put in prison that still have access to the community. They still have phones, visitation. They still have access to writing letters. They still control a lot of what's going on. So it's not a law enforcement problem to deal with the hardcore members. It's the community's problem to deal with the gonna be's. And that's what we're here today to talk about. Wow. I thought the hardest thing about coming here is the fact that I'm a University of South Florida grad. But <laughs> following Rusty's gonna be a little harder. I saw somebody else. Um, from the school's perspective, I have to give OCPS a lot of credit, and it's not just because I'm employed by OCPS, but it's for approximately a year now, OCPS has been working very closely with Rusty and several other groups to start to address this issue and how, what the implications are within the school system. Mr. Rodriguez touched, touched on the fact that it shouldn't be a zero tolerance policy within schools within reason, because there are certain expectations that cannot be tolerated within the school setting, not only by the adults in the school, but by other children in the school and by you as community members. You don't want weapons on campus. You don't want serious acts of violence on campus. Those are things that have to be addressed. We don't want drugs on our campus. But Orange County recognizes that when you start looking statistically nationwide, that 30% of eighth graders are not graduating from high school. And you start looking at other factors, the other social factors that are, that are piling up against students the, the difference now between the haves and the have-nots, the increasing issues not right now with financial burdens and implications, single-parent households, uh, increasing minority student enrollment and, and second language issues, and all those factors start to create what Rusty's talking about, about the gonabies. I speak with colleagues all the time in elementary school level where you're hearing about second and third graders being recruited by kids in the neighborhood or by other gang members. And what, you, what we fail to see as a community sometimes is a, a great example, I had a conversation with a parent not too long ago who said, well, my son's not a gang member, but he's in a clique. <laughs> but your son's got all the symptoms of being involved in a group. And please understand, the definition, the true definition of a gang goes far beyond when we talk about the ones that we all commonly hear about, the Latin Kings, the Bloods, the Crips. Those are your national gangs. But what we're increasingly seeing within our communities are the local issues, and they are still underground, have an affiliation with a larger group, a larger segment of the population. But these local groups are often overlooked as just being kids and groups of kids. Um, but they have, again, some of the signs and symptomology that we need to be more cognizant of. And again, the county is working very closely with high school, elementary school, middle school feeder patterns, with Rusty, with, with the Orange County Sheriff's Department to develop more, a more proactive role about, okay, how do we, not only the prevention, but the education part for parents that Mr. Rodriguez also talked about. There is an ignorance there between generations, and we know that. We got away with things. We can all reflect on things. We got away with as children that our parents never caught us doing, 
And we say, okay, I don't want my child to do that. But this is the era of MySpace, of Facebook, of kids putting things out there and, and doing things subliminally or underground that parents are not necessarily aware of. You're looking at parents who are coming from middle class or upper class families whose child has become involved in activities that are potentially gang related um, as a result of the culture that we've allowed to develop within our community. Um, I grew up in Miami. I'm a former gang member. The issue there for me, I've grown up. I grew up in a culture of rap music. I grew up in a, in a system of, of impoverishment. And my family had to physically move me from one neighborhood to another to get away from that. And I was a success. I did great. So I counsel my kids now about what they need to be doing. The conversations I've had with parents, my child doesn't do that. Well, when was the last time that you checked your child's bedroom? When was the last time you checked your child's MySpace page? When was the last time that it, it, kids are sending threats? Kids are sending, putting pictures out there. And what people don't understand is the implication that has on a school campus every single day. You're dealing with issues where we're being notified of threats on buses or through the internet, or, and that's just my school. And I have a very safe culture at my campus, but it's impacting all of us. And so it's truly a community issue that needs to be addressed. And it starts with educating parents. It starts with educating the community. It starts with educating kids and letting them have access to information to prevent them from becoming gonna be's. Because if we don't stop them now, that 30% dropout rate affects all of us. Because if those students are not in school, if 30% of my eighth graders, I have 1,000 students in my campus, if 300 of my kids don't graduate high school, they're running around the neighborhoods and they're getting in trouble. And it's not necessarily just a gang issue. That's juvenile crime that's being committed in the neighborhood because they feel left out. They feel that there's no connection for them. When you have students right now who are looking at a system, and this is potentially why you have a 30% dropout rate, you have kids now who are in middle school who are not age appropriate for middle school any longer because of a system, because of issues that are arising. And so Orange County Public Schools is taking a very strong stance to be proactive to address those issues and look for specialized programming and specialized training and working outside of our individual silos. That's a big phrase right now being used in Orange County Public Schools. We operate in our individual silos and we tend to look at the other group and say, well, they're not supporting me, and they're not supporting me, and they're not doing their fair share. It doesn't matter. What needs to happen is everyone needs to be aware of everyone else's participation and level participation and open the lines of communication. I think that we've started to do that over this past year, and you'll see some, you'll see some significant improvements in those areas. Um, some of the other issues, there is no easy solution. There absolutely, positively is no easy solution. You never know which kid's going to do what. You never know what's actually going on within your community. And again, that's a lot of really effective communication and, and, and education amongst ourselves about what are we looking for. You know, it starts off with maybe some vandalism, then it goes to graffiti, and then you have physical violence. And the wannabes, I hate to say this, because there's no segment of control there, there is no hierarchy at times within that group, they tend to be more violent or more abusive or, or they get try, try to expand what they're, getting, what they're doing right now because they feel there's a, there's a fit, there's a, um, an image that they have to fit into. Um, but again, it's a cultural thing. You're looking at issues that are affecting kids nationwide, you know, of socioeconomic issues, of impoverishment, of language barrier, of education or lack of access to, to appropriate levels of education. Um, you also have an issue there where you're looking at what's going on within the music industry, within the video game industry, within TV. Most recently we caught a couple kids, you know, you, you're talking to kids and you see little black dots on the, in, in the corner of their thumb and forefinger because they're watching History Channel every single night for the past three months. History Channel has been running a, running a show every night about ganglands and gangs. And the kids see that and they imitate what they're seeing. And so it's very hard nowadays, as Mr. Rodriguez was talking about and, and, and Rusty was talking about, to differentiate between groups. How do you know who your true gang member is versus who just wants to fit that picture? Kid moves here from Chicago and wants to fit into a school because he knows absolutely nothing, no one, he's 15 years old, wants to become instantly popular within a school setting, what's he gonna do? He buys into a culture and a climate and then everybody can overreact to that situation and then you're pushing that student, now his reputation carries him further and garners him some respect falsely within the, within the community. And that itself can place that student in jeopardy because now he feels like there's a role that he has to fit into. 
And now within the true community, people start to hear that, and the real people start to hear that, and then those kids are in jeopardy. And so, you know, again, the schools take a stance as far as violence on campus, as far as dress codes, as far as working with your SRO. This year, Orange County Public Schools, as every year, recognizes their classified employees of the year, and they recognize their teachers of the year. This year, I'm proud to say that we had approximately six SROs, school resource officers, that were recognized by their faculties and communities as being outstanding classified employees of the year because they go the extra mile to work and build relationships with kids. And so I think that you're starting to see, again, those silos break down and we're all coming together to try and overcome this issue. But it, I think there was another comment made, parental involvement's key and parental education, education is key as well. Thank you. <laughs> Try to add. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Roland Rivera. I'm Sergeant of the Orange County Sheriff's Office. I'm going to start off by thanking you all for inviting me. Um, as I've said to many people this morning, I think this discussion is way overdue in Orange County. Um, I've been in Orange County for 15 years as a law enforcement officer, probably half of that involved in gangs, uh, both as an investigator and a supervisor unit. And I've seen the evolution of gangs here in Orange County. Back in the early 90s when I started in enforcement here, uh, we had a lot of um, neighborhood groups, what we call hybrid gangs. It operated as uh, uh, neighborhood cliques, started out. But uh, today in Orange County, we've evolved to something more than that. Uh, we had some of the major national gangs uh, that Mr. Rodriguez talked about move into our community. And uh, as of December of 2006, we're up to 72 documented gangs in Orange County with about 5,000 documented members. Um, I gotta tell you, uh, our unit does a good job of trying to keep up with, uh, with gangs in Orange County, but we're probably, that's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're, we're probably tripling those numbers easily in Orange County. And you look at uh, the surrounding areas, Osceola Lake, also a, a growing gang problem. So I think this discussion's long overdue. Um, as far as some of the other things I've heard in, in discussion today uh, in the role of the community, I think it's important to point out that one thing I, uh, I recognize is there's kind of some separation in talk as far as uh, which group does what and how we do it. And the bottom line is um, I think we need to discuss that everybody involved in this is part of the community, including law enforcement. I think it's naive to believe that um, one group, whether you're an activist or a school or whatever, is going to do it without uh, everybody involved. Law enforcement is part of the community and we need to be involved. Um, I think law enforcement across the country, to include here in Orange County, have made great strides to try to do things themselves. Um, not only, uh, as I heard today, tag them and bag them. Um, I think that's a misnomer. Uh, law enforcement over the years has been involved in a lot of different things on the prevention side. There are programs like GREAT, which is a gang resistance educate, or gang resistance education and training, I can't get it out, uh, which has been in place in schools for many years. Uh, it caters, it's a curriculum, 12-week program that caters to anti-gang um, teachings in mid, uh, middle school level. Uh, we have DARE programs, which has been around forever, drug uh, resistance training. Uh, we have programs here in Orange County, the JAM unit, which is uh, in coordination with the juvenile justice dis system, basically assists um, juvenile probation officers and doing curfew checks and visiting children on a regular basis um, as, part of their, uh, as part of their probation and holding them accountable for the sanctions to include the sanctions imposed on them by their parents. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of good things being done by law enforcement on the front end, as Mr. Rodriguez said, to try to combat gangs. Um, unfortunately for some, suppression I think is a necessary thing. Um, you know, in 2005 there was a study by the Department of Justice uh, basically, they sent out a gang survey uh, across the country to law enforcement agencies. And I think the numbers came back, 30, an estimated 35,000 gangs across the country with, with membership uh, up near a million. Um, I think no matter what we do in the community, um, up front, there's going to be a portion of people that are just bad people. There are going to be gang members that are out there committing crime and doing bad things that need to go to prison. Um, Law enforcement's job um, is to assist in public safety, and uh, that's part of what we do. Um, but uh, I've heard a lot of things 
you know, this, this morning about kind of separation. Law enforcement shouldn't be involved in that. Um, I think, I think we, can, we can come together. I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of things being done across the country to include the Baltimore Project, where uh, community activist groups, um, YMCAs are, are dealing with, and different other groups in the community are dealing with the prevention side, law enforcement's being involved in the suppression side, and then there's aftercare, as uh, Rusty mentioned, uh, for people that are being released from prisons or being uh, uh, wanting to get out of gangs and change their ways. So I think we can do it. It's just a matter of, uh, of getting it together, and this, this discussion's a great start. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> A lot of good stuff at the at the table and with Mr. Rodriguez. I'm Karen Broussard. Um, I'm the director of program development at Jewish Family Services, and I also chair the Orange County Children's Cabinet. Um, and I think what I'd like to comment on is um, I'd like to pick up on what Mr. Rodriguez mentioned about the deindustrialization in the cities of Chicago and Los Angeles being such an important factor in the increase of gang membership and activity. Um, because I think what we don't recognize in Orlando is that we're just not a quiet little suburb anymore. I think that we all like to think that we were. I also like, like um, Mr. Means at the end of the table, have, I've been here since 1968. I've seen a lot of changes in this community. Um, and we're not a quiet little suburb anymore. Um, and some of it has to do with the economics. A lot of it has to do with the economics of this community. If you, you know, think about a brief history of Orlando from 68 on, which I can speak to, it was the opening of Disney in 72. It changed uh, the picture of this community on the spot. Um, in many ways, I think there was an over, um, sort of an overview uh, a, a conventional wisdom that said, oh, how great, look at, look at the money and the attention that that is going to bring to this community, and it did, and Orlando grew. But with that type of growth, that theme park growth that became so predominant, that tourism growth um, in Orlando came thousands and thousands of low-wage, very insecure jobs. Um, and with that came a lot of risk of poverty, or low-income working families, marry that to the um, welfare to work initiative in the mid-90s, and suddenly that, that was another one of those great public policies that sounded great but wasn't really well thought out and had tremendous unintended consequences, i.e., great, the idea of getting, moving families, particularly single moms, off of wel welfare after having been on welfare for many ge generations and getting them into the workforce was a great idea. However, there wasn't enough, there were not nearly enough community supports in place to support child care, to support um, families from being at risk, economically vulnerable, to one single event throwing that family into complete disarray. Needless to say, as that occurs, and then you, of course, throw in things like 9-11 that had a tremendous impact for our area on the tourism industry. Then you throw in the four hurricanes of 2004, another tremendous impact on low-income, vulnerable people in the Orlando area. We are an, a non-unionized state. We are a essentially no tax state. Nobody wants to pay tax dollars in this state. What happens was you found families be increasingly vulnerable in this community as it grew. And we also became that place where folks who already were in gangs, kids who were already in gangs, had to move to. As Chicago and LA and the other cities they were in became impossible for them to live because there was no work, thinking that Florida would be a better place to work, certainly a warmer place to work. And the truth was, it, that's not the case. And so we had this perfect storm come together of creating an environment where families became not only economically vulnerable, but emotionally and psychologically vulnerable. Parents were no longer available if they were able to work. They had to work several jobs in order to afford unaffordable housing, basically, let alone in a safe neighborhood. 
So we got fractured families. You get fractured families, you get kids who are looking for some connection, some sense of being, of belonging. You talk about the allure. We have to figure out what the allure is. The allure is a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of rules, a sense of stability. I know gangs, it doesn't seem like that would be stability, but that is stability. Absolutely, it's stability. Because families, parents, single moms, single dads, whatever the makeup, however that family looked, no longer was really able to look after those children because they were trying to work in an impossible economic situation to keep a roof over the head or, or over their heads or food on the table or choose between medical care or have an accident or have an illness. Um, I think that is some of what has happened in Orlando that has fed into the increase in gang activity or whether or not, whether it's gang activity or not, but certainly the increase in juvenile crime, uh, violence, a sense of disaffectedness and dis disconnection among the youth in Orlando. Um, what's been difficult, I think, is that we are a community who has not wanted to recognize where all of these pieces connect. None of us work in a vacuum. I think most of us have said that here. We don't work in a vacuum, and we all do need to work together to be able to um, effectively make any kind of a change, both on an economic policy level, on social policy levels, on community policy levels, and on how, in fact, we are going to help the youth in our community who feel so disaffected that they find connection and community in a pretty dysfunctional, violent world, the world of gangs. Um, there are, I am, I'm happy to say, I'm actually kind of optimistic, though that didn't sound optimistic at all, what I just talked about. <laughs> But I am really quite optimistic because in the community I recognize in the last couple of years a much greater recognition of the need to do just that, to integrate everybody's efforts, to integrate the efforts of law enforcement and juvenile justice and mental health and substance abuse and bring people all together at the same table, the providers. Um, there is you know, a strong relationship between the needs of kids who are in foster care and the needs of kids who are in gangs and the needs of kids who are just who are not doing well in school there's a tremendous need for that and as we can if we can continue to have enough momentum in the community with the advent of the regional commission on homelessness that's going to really look at affordable housing and start to really look at the poverty issues in Orlando or the Tri-County region and how that impacts families. And we can integrate that with the work of the Orange, Osceola, and Seminole County children's cabinets um, and eventually pull in folks of enough influence, who have enough influence to be able to be talking to our legislators in Tallahassee about the need for funding for this. We may be able to make a dent. I'm seeing a different sort of framework emerging in terms of the momentum in the community. So that's my, my, my take on it. I am really getting good at that stuff. <laughs> uh, we want to um, allow the opportunity right now, <clears throat> excuse me, for you to ask questions to the panel. And I know there is an issue with projecting your voices. And I know it's because of Okay. Um, so we ask that if you are going to ask a question, I believe they need to speak into that mindset. This will just be for television. You have to yell your questions. At least we'll be able to take you properly. So. Nice. Is there anyone that has any questions for the panel, please? Yes. Joe and I to talk about the involvement of the community. So my question is, what is the community? Where does the school system be there? I mean, middle school, there's no sport. I mean, so where's the positive outcome for these children who are at risk? I am assuming that's directed at me. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there's quite a bit of, of middle school athletics and, and after school and before school programs. Every, every middle school in Orange County either participates in the Big Brothers and Big Sisters or Boys and Girls Club or has YMCA, both before school and after school programming to provide because as the juvenile justice research shows, during those critical hours, especially here in Orange County with a large segment of our population who are employed through hospitality, they're required to be at work either very early or very late. 
And so the school system, in collaboration with those local agencies, does quite a bit to provide morning coverage for families starting at 7 a.m. on most of our campuses and going to 6 p.m. at night. In addition to what Orange County Sheriff's Department partners with all the schools to provide the Police Athletic League every Tuesday and Thursday. For example, on my campus, kids are there till 6 p.m. Playing, playing a sport, supervised by deputies. They volunteer their time. Um, they also have uh, midnight basketball. A lot of schools are still participating in that. Um, but those types of activities are there for, for students and for the community to become involved in. I was asked a question before we began today that said, you know, is your YMCA capped for students to participate in the after school program? And I said, no, the only burden that after school programs typically face is for that child who lives so far away from our campus that it's not safe for them to commute on their own and or the parents not available to provide transportation. And for example, I run an after school program at Liberty Middle School where 130 to 150 students are there every single day after school, keeping them involved, providing tutoring, dance, drama, art. They do play computer games, I have to admit. Um, they, the Guitar Hero is a big popular thing right now. Um, but they do a lot of those types of things. So I think the school system does provide a lot of activities. As far as the school system is, system's involvement in educating parents, that's something that I said we've been, we're working on because we want to be far more proactive. But there is a line at times between how much responsibility the school has to assume at certain points. You know, and our willingness to become involved in this and share information and develop a program, not just to discipline those kids when they cross the line at schools, but to be far more proactive in developing. We're looking into several programs nationwide that are being used and are being very effective of prevention. So when kids come to school, if they get, end up in an in-school suspension situation or they're identified or there's a willingness and a communication that that student identifies himself or herself because that is a growing segment of the population as well as our female students. But having a program in place, not just a video where the kid answers some questions, but a program that involves some guidance counselors, intervention services, our safe coordinators, our SROs, our school administrators, and teachers. Um, Bill Daggett's research um, supports the, th the new three R's, rigor, relevance, and, 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 relevant, er, and relationships. That's the part that OCPS is really focusing on, is building those relationships. Because it does strain the relationships that school system has with our community. 70 to 80% of community members have absolutely no ties to the public school system other than what they see and hear through the local media. And a lot of times that's not necessarily the most positive paint picture that they're painting for us. And so we realize that and OCPS again is being very proactive in working with other agencies to develop a program to do exactly what you're, what you're to address your concern. And that is, that is part of the overall program. That is part of the parental communication, parental involvement is a huge aspect that we need to address and, and that we're looking and focusing on as well as part of the overall project. Because again, the school system cannot work in isolation. And you've heard that from numerous people up here. I need the parents to be involved. It's something as simple as if you have a child and your child's ever gotten a detention or gotten, gotten disciplined at school, the most frustrating aspect of a child being disciplined at school is, was the lack of parental communication. As a principal, I get more calls from parents saying, I wish I'd known that, the, that this teacher has been talking to my child every day about their behavior rather than letting it escalate and getting to this point. That happens. That breakdown of communication, we are working on. Um, OCPS you know, and other school systems across the state have purchased the immediate 911, our ability to, to send messages out instantaneously to families. Um, we do it in both languages. We try and provide print materials in, in, three, native, in three languages, and we're working on others. Um, you know, that's an aspect that we continue to struggle with. Uh, but parental involvement overall, statistically speaking, is down. It's an all-time low, especially at the middle school level. Um, I'll give you a great example. PTSA and SAC meetings, you can have as, as few as six parents show up once a month. Um, I've got 1,000 students, that means I have potentially 2,000 parents, but I'm getting six to turn out. And we, and, but that's a cultural thing that we need to address, and schools are actively pursuing venues on how they can do that.
I think one, uh, I'd like to make one comment, please. Um, a couple of comments to, to your question. I think the question that you're asking is um, not as common as the other side of the question is, why aren't the other ones not getting involved? And I know that Roland can, can uh, attest to this. I'll just give you an example. We do town hall meetings all over the county and have done town hall meetings all over the county regarding gang awareness, gang identification, what parents can do to identify, recognize, and who to notify. And we have the same turnout. We end up with eight people at a town hall meeting. And I think the younger the kid, the less support, the less input from the parent. Because we're ended up now with a generational influence. We have younger and younger kids having kids. So when you get up into the high middle school, into the high schools, the parents are older, much more mature, much more responsible, much more engaged from, from my aspect of it. The younger we go down into the grades and into the kids, the less input from the parents because of that generational. I mean, we've got, I mean, Roland can, uh, again, to, can attest to this. Across this country, we have three generations of gang members now. I mean, I've got grandkids, fathers, and grandfathers that are gang banging. Now, the grandfather may not be out there doing drive-bys, but he's got, he's got leadership authority. So how is it that we take a kid that's in an environment and tell him that it doesn't pay to be a gang member when he's got two generations that he's following to do that? So I think the generational issue is in there. The, uh, the lack of parent involvement. Again, I think you're one of the few that would come up and say, what else can I do to get involved? I can give you another comment. He mentioned that the, the all-time low of parent involvement. We do an anti-gang poster contest every year and have done it for 11 years. Up until this year, we've included every middle school and every high school in the state of Florida. It's over 1,800 schools. Five years ago, we would get 2,000, 3,000 submissions. Ten years ago, we would get 2,000, 3,000 submissions. Last year, we got 200 submissions. Eight years ago, we would bring the, we had a first, second, and third place for middle school, first, second, and third place for high school. We would bring the child and the parents to our annual conference. They would get savings bonds. The, the first place winner would get a thousand bucks. That's a lot of money to a kid in the fifth grade. It's a lot of money to me. <laughs> and we would bring the parents and the kids to the, the conference. We'd introduce them to our membership and to the politicians and our leadership and our political leadership. And they would be able to do news conferences and they would get them involved. We'd turn their posters into billboards and t-shirts. And there's cops all over this state wearing these posters on the back of their shirts. Roland's got a half a dozen of them. So do I. We've not had a single parent come to our conference and even acknowledge the fact that their kid won in more than five years. Un sadly enough, I have to spend three months after the announcement of the winner just to get the parent to return a phone call to give them the thousand bucks. Now how, I mean, come on, if we can't pay them to answer the phone, how are we going to get them to do anything else? I think these are the things, and this is where that community issue comes in. This is the, the systematic problem that we have. And the, the communication is going to be key and it's going to be vital. And one of the things that I've brought up to, to our government here and to governments across the state is that we may have to look at utilizing some unconventional methods. Because I think we're in a society now to where, quite frankly, we're too lazy after working 12 hours a day to drive to a town hall meeting. Or we're too tired, we're too exhausted because of having to work the two and three jobs that she talked about. So we have to utilize different mechanisms to get that information out. And I, I've often said, like, Orange County's won, Palm Beach County's won. Several major counties across the state have their own governmental TV channels. How easy is it for us to do one of these and have a fake audience if we had to <laughs> and, and, and tape it such as this and then run it on Orange TV or run it on Palm Beach TV or Miami TV to talk about issues like this to get that information out? Frederick mentioned about the uh, reverse 911 type phone calls where we can say, hey, remember, you've got a parent-teacher meeting. I submitted to Palm Beach County that maybe we utilize that as, as a gang awareness type of situation too. If we have a situation, I mean, we can utilize that for anything other than just, hey, you've got a meeting tomorrow. Uh, and these are, again, these are unconventional methods that may not work, 
But I think we need to utilize in this day and age technology to get the information back out to the parents because it's technology that is impeding most of the parents from getting engaged. Um, can I, I'm yes, sorry, please. can I just Go make ahead. one comment and I'll be short. Um, I couldn't agree more. I'm a social worker. I know there's a lot of social workers and social work students in this audience. And that is going to be your challenge going forward, is figuring out how to engage parents into this discussion, into, into the work that needs to be done in ways that have not been done before. Because what we've used in the past is no longer, is no longer working because the structure of families is very different, particularly where we live. There are too many parents working two and three jobs or single moms or no child care. The idea of them coming out or blended families with, you know, lots of kids, the idea of them coming out on a weeknight after they've worked 12 hours or maybe are going out on their next four-hour shift on something, forget it. It's not an option. So that really is a challenge, a charge to every social work student out here to be looking at how else to, um, how to figure out accessibility, that big social work word and affordability. One of the things, and I know Roland can attest to more from the law enforcement perspective of what they do, uh, but we do quite a bit with that, quite a bit. And I think one thing to understand is to go back in a situation to where in a, in a society that we have freedom of speech and we can do anything we want to do, and as long as they're not committing a crime, they can do what, and, and being a gang member is not a crime. We have a constitutional right to association. Now, the crime that they commit, obviously, is what makes them illegal. But here's, what, here's where we're in a face with, with things such as Facebook and MySpace. It's the instantaneous of being worldwide. When you look at the fact that the reason why a lot of these kids and these adults get involved in these gangs is for the instant recognition, the instant identity, the instant identity. You know, one of the biggest things that's one of my soapboxes that I can get way off left field with, and that's the glorification of the gangster lifestyle regarding videos, music, video games, and even movies. We glorify it. I've got gang members not wanting to dress like gang members anymore because they're tired of looking like everybody else. <laughs> and it's the truth. And when you look at a situation to where these, a lot of these kids, they see on TV, and I'm not bashing any one group. I'm not bashing any one particular TV station. I won't even name a TV station. But if you have a gang video or if you have a music video, and they look at a TV and these kids that just inspire to be rich in a society that wants instantaneous gratification instead of working hard like our grandparents and the grandparents before them did, where they didn't anticipate because the ability to be instant millionaires is, wasn't even an option for them back then. So they, they automatically looked at what 30 years of working was going to be. Today, these kids look at what I can do in 30 days, and some of them in 30 minutes. And when you look at a society that promotes this glorification of this thug lifestyle or thug life, whether it be by video or video games, they see that as instant recognition. I had one particular 12-year-old said that he wanted to be a gang member because he wanted to have what was on TV. And he mentioned MTV specifically regarding these gang videos. Now, I call them gangster videos because they act like thugs in some of these music videos. And these kids see them getting these $100,000 cars and driving in these $5 million boats and living in these $2 million homes, and they don't realize that there's only a few very rich, very wealthy, very powerful rap artists in this country. Most of them are just as poor as we are. <laughs> and they, rent, and, and they, they make these videos, they rent the cars, they rent the jewelry, they rent the women, they rent the boats, they rent the house, they do the video, and then when they get done, they get and they they stop, they 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 get in their Nissan Sentra and they drive back to their double wide. <laughs> they don't live in five million dollar homes. So when you end up with a situation where these kids want to emulate that and they want that lifestyle, MySpace gives them the opportunity to do that. 
where YouTube gives them the opportunity to do that because they can take a $50 camera, some, some, some of their idiot friends, <laughs> put some of this stupid clothing on, and get out there and go nuts on a video, and for five minutes put it on YouTube, and then watch and see how many hits they get. I watched a show last night that I typically don't watch, but I, had, but I listened as I was flipping through the channel. He, he mentioned something about MySpace. Well, being in law enforcement background, MySpace is a big topic for us right now. And we teach it all over the country. So when he stopped, when he said MySpace, I stopped on it. Okay, now, this was the uh, Carson Daly show on at like 1 o'clock in the morning, right? And they have a new segment on his TV show where you can submit things to him through his MySpace account. And he brings his laptop and sits it up on his desk and he brings up his MySpace account. And if the, all these people from all over the world are posting messages and he's reading them on TV. So now all of a sudden you can have instantaneous recognition on the Carson Daly Show. This one particular group, which when they showed the, when they took the video, the camera, the TV camera and, 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 and hovered over the laptop, it was, a, it was a gangster style group out of Atlanta that had submitted their music on a $10 video camera and put it on there and, and he listened to it and it was F this and F that and do this and do that and MF this and MF that. And then when he gets done, he says, you guys are going to go far. Next. And this is on Carson Daly in the middle of, I mean, yeah, it's at 1 o'clock in the morning, but it doesn't make a difference. In a world of technology, we are our own worst enemy. And we've created an environment that has allowed these people to get instantaneous recognition by doing exactly what you just said through, the, through YouTube. You can go to YouTube and type in Latin Kings and get 4,500 videos. You can type in Crips and get 3,500. There's hundreds and thousands of these videos that get uploaded for free every single day. And there's nothing that can be done for that. Now, if there's a crime within that video, that's where Roland comes in. And, and Roland can, uh, can comment on that particular area. Sure. <laughs> Now, uh, to answer the question, yes, there are, there are some things we can do. But as Rusty said, uh, being on MySpace, being on YouTube, some of the other ones, it's not illegal. There are some illegal things that, that are done. Um, and there are some things that we can do. I can't really get specific into it. And, and one of the things that we've run into in the past, when, uh, when MySpace first became popular and we started doing investigations, we actually leaked out some stuff to parents and tried to educate them. And what the kids were doing is, is typing in passwords and locking their computers so they, they could, you could only be invited into their space, things like that, which made it harder for us. And when you, you actually see stuff like kids holding AK-47s and shooting it off and things like that. Unless you can get in there, um, it makes it very difficult for us to, to, uh, to investigate. So I can't get too deep into what we do, but we, we are aware of it. Um, there are, uh, in, across the country, there are, there are some uh, agencies that actually have computer crimes people. That, that's all they do is visit YouTube, visit MySpace, visit other sites to try to get people um, that are committing crimes using computers. So there is something being done about it. Do we have time for one more question from you? The back, we have another one from you. Yes, sir. Uh, how do we get child support from his parents? <laughs> that's a great, gr great question. Um, there's a lot of dynamics about getting child support. And you would think every spouse, divorced spouse, or, or the mother of the child or father of the child would want to get that. They don't always want child support because when they get child support, they also get involvement with the person that had the child. So it's not always as easy as just going after the people who do that. In many cases, they do want child support, and the, and the spouse will not, or the, the father of the child or the mother of the child will not participate. It takes a lot of social services and it takes a lot of government services to match those things up. Fortunately, in Orange County and, and Osceola County, we have a fairly high record of getting that compared to some of the counties in, Orange, in Florida. Money will solve part of the problem by having mothers have more money for their children so they can provide the things they need to provide. That's one thing. But education and reading. I'm going to tell you something that uh, I wanted to mention when I first spoke. Uh, I had been meeting with the... Department of Juvenile Justice had the previous one because they've had several. And they were in our office with Mr. Lamar and myself. And uh, one of the things he said was really shocked me, even after all these years. He said, by the time a child is out of third grade, we can be able to tell the ratio of how many 
by, by the time children are out of third grade, we can tell how many prison cells we need to build at their age 18, which is six years later. Which means that you can go ahead, and, or five years later, you can go ahead and project by education reading level how many prison beds you have to build. Now obviously, if that's, that is the key. Education and reading is essential. If moms and dads do not have reading abilities and education abilities, you just see this spiraling down. Uh, and one of, the reasons, one of the ways you can do that is provide a very open-ended community system, as long as you can get people there. But I want to go back to the child support. Uh, only way you're going to do that is if you make it easy for the parent to get to the courthouse, to the businesses, to the places where they can file the paperwork. Orange and Osceola County, which is the circuit that I work in, is a very, very large area. Many people have transportation problems. And if you're making, if you're making ends meet and you're in a bus, getting the services to you is very difficult. And I think one of the things we need to do is be able to see how we can make services easier to the parents of these children so they can get services to enforce child support. I think the courts are ready to do this. When courts get these cases, for the most part, they do a pretty good job, in my opinion. Uh, they could do better, but I think we need to have more community neighborhood service centers where parents can go to do the paperwork they need to do to get child support.